the last chapter is only a page long and it's all about putting together your own development plan. And so I really encourage readers, you know what, you've, you've read the book, you've taken notes, you've dog-eared pages, you've done something to, to call out something that mattered to you. Write it down, make yourself a smart goal, and then go find somebody you can work with on that within the week. Yeah. So within seven calendar days, talk with a colleague, talk with somebody inside, outside of work, but just say, hey, you know, I read this book and this is what I took away from it and can we kick ideas around? Hi, and welcome to Helping People Perform, the podcast that gives you fascinating insights into those people whose chosen vocation is to help others perform at their best. From consultants to teachers, sports coaches to financial advisors, all of my guests share a passion for getting the most out of individuals, teams, and organizations. Enjoy the episode. So hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Helping People Perform. Delighted to be joined today by CEO of Gerard Training Solutions. Um, and this is someone who's helping new managers transform from those brilliant individual contributors to great people leaders and people managers. So delighted to have on the show today, Eric Gerard. So welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Oh, really looking forward to this conversation. I know we've got some great stuff to talk about in terms of what you do now and uh, the book that you've got coming out uh, tomorrow at time of recording, so, so it's exciting times. Um, hopefully by the time this is out, the book will be on the shelves and people will be able to buy it. Let's come back to, to that as we go through. But let's start off, like I always do, by asking people about their background. You know, What got you to where you are today? What's your background story? Yeah, so... I'll work backwards. So where I am today is running my own training and development firm, my own management development firm. I love facilitation. I love teaching. I love helping people who are new at something progress and, and become masters at it. Right. And that all started when I was 15 in the Boy Scouts. Okay. I used to work at a summer camp, my local summer camp for Boy Scouts. And I used to love helping kids figure out how to paddle a canoe and swim and row a boat. You know, and, and I used to love to, to see the, the light bulbs pop over their head when they could suddenly get that canoe to do whatever they wanted. You know, they, they right. went from, oops, oh, that's not it, to, ah, I like this. Right. And I used to, I, I found early on in life that I liked teaching people how to do stuff. Right. That took me through two degrees, a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. I wound up in Australia for a while doing some training. Okay. Uh, I've taught English in Japan and landed in Silicon Valley in 1999 and started out doing employee development, new hire orientation, welcoming, welcoming new hires to the, to the company, right. and eventually landed in management development. And I've, I did that for 20 years before I, I left the Bay Area, left Silicon Valley, and came up to Seattle, where I am now. Yeah. Oh, what an amazing background. I'm sure there's so much to, to learn on there. Maybe I'll, I'll pick up on a slightly shared uh, history in there in terms of I spent time in New Zealand. You've spent time mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from your time there and what were you up to and what were some of the, the highlights of your, your time in Australia? Yeah, so I went to Australia because there was a girl and I, <laughs> I, followed, I followed the girl to Sydney. And I remember being, you know, visiting Australia. When I went to go and visit her a couple of times, I felt like, hey, this is a good place. I could live here. Like, I get this. Yeah. And that was the first time I really experienced culture shock because – I'd be cruising along and Australia is a lot like America and it feels really similar and this is really good. And Sydney is a lot like San Francisco. It's a city, you know, on a key or on a bay. Yep. And then something would come and whop me upside the head and just remind me, you are not home. This is not America. This is Australia and it's different. Right. So, <laughs> so that, that was one of the things that I, I walked away from with that experience. But I, I almost became a citizen of Australia. I, I had a permanent residency and... Um, yeah, it, it was really close to my considering uh, citizenship. And I decided to, you know, the, the relationship fell apart. And I came home and kind of left that alone. Wow. Amazing. The, uh, the different journeys you could have been on if one or two things were slightly different, eh? So, uh. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, yeah, one, one left turn instead of a right turn. And I could, be, I could be raising kids outside Sydney somewhere. Who knows? <laughs> um, the other piece I, I just noted down that I'd love to uh, pick your brains on as well is Silicon Valley, um, right in the end of the 90s, early 2000s. Is that, was that the time in, you were talking about there? Yeah, so I, I moved to Mountain View um, December of 1999, so right at the top of the dot-com bubble. 
Wow. <laughs> and so what were some of your experiences there? What's, uh, what's Silicon Valley like to work in? What people and, and, uh, and sort of de- management development lessons did you learn from that space? Uh, there's, I learned a lot. There was, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff and a lot of not so good stuff. Um, when I got there, the company I was working for was growing like mad. And so the stock was, was growing like mad, you know, and mm. we were all given chunks of stock as grants. And I remember walk, walking through the building one day and there was a guy kind of walking in a daze. He just, he looked completely out of it. And I said, are you okay? Everything all right? He said, I, I'm a millionaire. Like on pay on paper, like his stock had hit a point where he had become a millionaire. Right. And he was young. He was in his thirties. And he's like, I'm a millionaire. Hmm. And and so in that time, the the late nineties, early two thousands, the you know, there was money every place. Right. And that's all that people wanted to talk about. And I heard stories of guys going to bars to go have a drink and women would approach them and ask, you know, where do you work? And, you know, to strike up a conversation. Oh yeah, I work at, I work at Google or I work at Amazon or something like that. And then all of a sudden it was, Ooh, what's your strike price? You know, how many (laughs) shares do you have? It was like, Oh, stop. So that was, that was really interesting, but that, that didn't last long because the bubble burst and then, you know, we got kind of a dose of reality and the, the lessons that I learned that I think were most valuable were, from some of my best managers who coincidentally were all at the same company. And these folks were empathetic and kind and also firm. Like I got a swift kick in the butt a few times when I right. needed to get moving. But the way that these folks would recognize and reward us and would motivate us and coach and provide feedback, all these things I remembered and, and held them up in my mm-hmm. in my mind as ex- examples and what I wanted to do one day. Right. And then as I moved through my my career, I got the antithesis of those things, you know, and and got corrective feedback in a pl- in a public place in front of other people, you know, got dressed down in front of right. the other people. I'm like, well, that's that's not the right way to do it, hmm. you know. And so I, I I got a lot of object lessons in how to do it well, how to do it poorly, and then in a stroke of irony. I got promoted and became a manager and I did absolutely everything wrong. I micromanaged my team. I didn't set goals. I didn't provide good coaching or feedback. It was just, it was just a mess. So I walked away from all of that thinking, okay, never again, that's never going to happen to me or anybody else again. And that's why I ultimately wound up forming my own company and writing a book. Right. No, it's a really interesting there. And what's your take on like, why did you, with you knew everything, that you needed to do, you knew the things you didn't need to do, and yet you still fall, you, uh, found yourself sort of falling into that trap, which I know a lot of new managers in particular, but a lot of manager, managers in general sort of fall into. So why do you think that is? What are some of the drivers that even when people know what to do, they're still not doing what they need to? In my case, it was stress. It was extreme stress because I got promoted and then as, I, as soon as I said, yes, I'll take the job, my manager said, okay, and by the way, one of your new reports has been causing havoc in the organization and I want him gone. Wow. And so my manager essentially threw me into the bus and, and sandbagged me into doing his dirty work. So instead of being able to start with a, with a clean slate and say, okay, let's, let's, let's do the things. Let's, mm. let's, let's set goals. Let's talk about how we're going to delegate. Let's, let's talk about how you prefer to receive feedback, things like that. I immediately wound up in the lawyer's offices talking about how I'm going to put this person on a pip and manage them out. Right. And so because of that, I wound up, you know, super stressed and, and, and really reverted to command and control, which was absolutely the wrong thing to do. Yeah. No, it's a, it is amazing how even if I've seen it happen. I've, it's happened to me as well, you know, certainly in there, as I've been in those management roles, you step back and you think, I know I should be doing something different, but I don't, I can't find the time or I, I'm not even having the time to reflect and notice that I'm not doing the right thing. So uh, it, it's a, a trap we often fall into on that front. But um, one of the things I want to reflect on as well is, because uh, it's happened with a lot of other people and a lot of great managers and a lot of great people that I've spoken to, is the ability to stand back and go, when I have had amazing managers, what was it about them? Mm-hmm. What did they do? How did they make me feel? And what did they do to make me feel that way? And mm-hmm. conversely, 
what's the antithesis of that? What what are those managers who made me feel belittled or uh, you know other othered in some way? You know, and what do they do to make me feel that? So you can learn from those experiences and step back. And it, 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 has that been uh, something that has worked for you as you've grown through your career in terms of stepping back and reflecting? And is that the sort of thing that you help people with? Yeah, absolutely. I, I encourage people to reflect and, and think a little bit about, for example, in, in, in most of my courses, there's an activity right up front. Mm. Uh, for example, in, in, my, in my latest course, one of the first activities is reflect on your greatest manager and why were they your greatest manager. And of course, the moral of that story is to repeat the good stuff and avoid the bad stuff. Yeah. But then I tell a ton of stories um, about, you know, experiences I've had as to get people thinking about, oh, okay, well, I can relate to that. Or I had something similar happen. Or, ooh, I don't, I don't want that to happen mm. kind of a thing. Just to, to get the creative juices going. And then I encourage folks to reflect. I mean, as I get older, I'm, I'm starting to get more and more into like inner work. And so I recently took up mindfulness meditation mm. and just trying to become more calm and less reactive. Yep. Uh, I've even taken up yoga. I call it, I, I take gentle yoga. I call it stiff old man yoga. Right. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I am I, <laughs> in any yoga class. I am the stiffest, least flexible person in the room, <laughs> but it still helps. It's still yeah. useful. And so I, I keep doing it. And, and those two things help me kind of get grounded and it's like, okay, what do I, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? What do I really, really want? Mm. And that helps a lot. Ah, oh, wonderful. Maybe that segues nicely into the next segment, which is um, what do you do to help people? And so who do you help and how do you help them? Yeah. So my audience is very firmly new managers. Right. And and my my job is to help new managers transform from high performing individual contributors, high performing employees to great people managers. Right. And I offer over 20 courses uh, around that. And I just wrote a book uh, called Lead Like a Pro that right. is all about that. So that's everything I do is, is to help the new manager make that transition and then and thrive in their role. And then for experienced managers, I help them supercharge their skills. Right. So, you know, maybe you've been a manager, you've been a manager for a year, maybe 10 years, and you haven't really received any formal training mm. or you got trained 10 years ago and you'd like a refresher. All my, all my, all my concepts transfer to experienced managers as well. Right. Oh, wonderful. And um, so a couple of questions I've, I want to really want to follow up on here. So what was it? Firstly, you, you focus on new managers, particularly maybe some supercharged and some experienced managers. But um, what drew you to that sort of niche and that segment in terms of being able to focus your efforts on supporting new managers? Well, there's two answers to that. I mean, first off, I think the world needs it. I think that I think that new managers are often thrown in the deep end. They get promoted. Okay, you're a great engineer. You're a great coder. You're a great finance financial analyst. Fill in the blank. You're a great X. Yeah. So we're going to promote you, and you're going to be leading a team of your peers. Mm. Good luck. Right. And I just, <laughs> I, I don't think that's fair. I don't, mm. I don't think that that does anybody any good. And I don't think it's fair for the new manager or their team or the rest of the organization. Mm. And so my dream gig would be to have a company come to me and say, hey, we've got a cohort of folks who we're, we're looking to groom as managers. Can we run them through your class before they get promoted? Before, yeah. Yeah. Or, hey, they were promoted last month. Now right. come in, please. Yeah. You know, before they do too much damage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've already um, noted this yourself in terms of how quickly you can get into those bad habits and how quickly you can just start something. And it's difficult to reverse out of those, isn't it? So getting them, getting them in early and getting them even before they start their role, I can see the, uh, the real advantages there. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, first off, the world needs it. And then secondly, as I've kind of alluded to, I have been exposed to some fantastic managers, folks mm. who I would hold up as, as exemplars in how to do it right. And then I've suffered at the hands of folks who did it 100% wrong. Right. And so I, I want to repeat the good things that I experienced and, and what I know and the research I've done. And I want to help folks avoid those missteps so that they start on the right foot and build trust and build a bond and build community the right way from the start rather than stepping in it right away and making a mess and then trying to clean it up and spending weeks or months fixing mistakes they made because they just didn't they didn't realize that they were doing it wrong 
Mm. Yeah, and so out of interest, what are one or two of the uh, examples of both those good and bad that really stick with you? You know, what what are some of the things that those really good managers did? Maybe what one or two things that those poor managers did? And um, yeah, okay, I'm going to use first names. Uh, I won't, I won't, I won't name the innocent, but I'll, I'll use first names. So um, back in in the early days of Silicon Valley, so this would have been around 2000 or so. Uh, Jeff was one of my very best managers for lots of reasons, but one of the things that he did really, really well was reward and recognize and motivate us in a way that cost him and the company almost nothing. Right. But was very, very effective. So he would run weekly staff meetings. He'd bring us all together in a, in a conference room, the same conference room, the same same day, same time, every day or every week. And we, we would have a staff meeting and we were getting to know each other and so on. And one day he walks in with this little black stuffed gorilla. And we're like, Jeff, what's with a gorilla? <laughs> and he says, I'd like to introduce you to Stanley. Stanley will be our mascot. In order to earn Stanley, you have to surprise and delight an internal customer. So I have to hear from one of our internal customers because we were an internal training and development team. Yeah. So I have to hear from somebody in, say, finance or marketing or whatever that Joanne or Sandy absolutely hit it out of the park. And if I, if I get a love note like that, you'll get Stanley for that week. And Stanley can hang out in your office. You can do whatever you want with Stanley, but Stanley's kind of yours to show off. Right. And then you bring him back the next week and then we, we pass it around. Hmm. But it's not guaranteed that you're going to earn Stanley. You know, you may never have Stanley or you may get Stanley five times in a row. It just depends on what I hear from our customers. Right. So we agreed to that and we all started competing fiercely for Stanley because we all <laughs> wanted this little gorilla. And I earned him a lot of times and he, he would always sit on my bookshelf um, facing my door. So as people walked into my office, Stanley would greet them sort of a thing. Right. So Stanley was was really important to us and really boosted the morale of the team. And he was just this little silly stuffed gorilla. Well, in 2004, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer that almost killed me and it metastasized everywhere. And so I was really, really sick and in the hospital. And Jeff came to see me in the hospital and he brought Stanley. Oh, amazing. So I'm completely gorked up. I'm, I'm lying back on my bed. My eyes are crossed. I can't see. And he says, Eric, the team decided that they want you to have Stanley permanently. And he cans me Stanley. And in my drug-addled state, all I could manage to do was kind of lean forward and go, Stanley, and then fall back asleep. <laughs> but I, I loved Stanley. He was, he was like, that, that was the best thing that had happened to me yeah. was to get Stanley, you know, and to realize that the team was there for me, you know, right. even though they couldn't be in my, my hospital room. Mm. So I kept Stanley. And then fast forward, uh, when I had kids, I have twin 14-year-old daughters. And when they were about three or four, when they were old enough to understand, I brought out Stanley and told them his story and said, I want you to take care of Stanley. And they just glommed onto him. They just loved him fiercely. And we still have him. Yeah. Um, he's put away someplace safe and, and they'll probably give him to, to their kids. So Stanley probably cost Jeff $15 US, yeah. like nothing. Mm. And yet Stanley meant so much to the team. Mm. And then he meant so much to me personally and now I've passed them down to my kids, you know, like that's, that's genius yeah. motivation and recognition for something that costs almost nothing. Yeah. You know, so think, think about all the managers who just throw out innovation bonuses. Yeah. I'll yeah. give you 2,500 bucks if you come up with something cool. Jeff got us to perform at a very high level and en engendered huge loyalty for this $15 little stuffed animal. Perfect. That, that was just genius. Yeah. So that's the good side. That's an amazing story, yeah. Yeah, the, that's the good one. The bad one was at another company years later. I'm I'm in a in a meeting with my boss and a few a few of my colleagues. So it's there's you know the whole team is there, and I'm disagreeing with my boss about something. I don't like the way she's the the direction she wants to go with something. She pulls me out of the meeting, takes me into a crowded break room where people are coming and going. So there's there's people around. Mm. And she says loud enough for other people to hear, this is where coaching comes in. Maybe this isn't the job for you. And I was just gobsmacked. I'm like, first off, that's not coaching. Yeah. That's not coaching in any form that I know of. Secondly, it was in public. Yeah. And thirdly, she essentially threatened my job in this mm. coaching session. I'm like, okay, well, that that one definitely went in the book. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So, it, so that's, that's just an object lesson on what not to do. 
Right. You know, if you want to coach somebody, fine, but do it in, do it in private, watch your word choice, watch your tone of voice and be sure that you're not going to accidentally make your coachy defensive, mm. you know, just because you're keyed up and upset. Maybe you need to go calm down first before you provide that coaching. Yeah. No, amazing words of, of wisdom there, all about meeting people where they're at and, and mm -hmm. you know, going and thinking of their reaction to your words, not just what you want to say off the back mm -hmm. of that. So and, and you you mentioned the fact that um uh, you've got over twenty courses. So mm -hmm. um uh, tell us about the courses then. How do people get involved with those? Who who gets involved? Is it individuals, is it um organizations? Um how do your courses work? Yeah, so I typically go into corporations or, or, or companies and, and offer the course to a, a cohort of managers. Right. So a company a company and I will will negotiate and say, okay, we we need we need help with our managers. Our managers can't can't provide feedback or our managers can't um, can't set goals or our managers just have never had any training, sort of mm. a thing. And so I will either take one of my courses off the shelf or more often I will tailor what I've got to, to match the company culture. So one of the things that we do is, you know, I've got all these courses, which means we have a base to start with. And then I will work with the client, their stakeholders and so on to tweak and tailor the course so that it looks like it came from their, their folks. It's branded for them. Yeah. Um, I'll use their case studies. I'll use, I'll use their, uh, their terminology and their jargon and so on. So that it's landing well for the participants. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty fun process to actually tailor that program and, and, and tailor it for folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the end result is, is participants go through and they're like that, that, that hit the, that hit the mark. Like yeah. that helped, that helped a lot. Oh, wonderful. And I, I doesn't, my experience of this, and I had, had some experience recently um, over the last couple of weeks where I was delivering some training for another organization and they talked about another part of training that they'd had on slide presentations and you know, how, to, how to create great slides was part of their new manager's role. Um, and they said, we'd bought this stuff off the shelf, you know, the, tra the standardized training. We thought, great, it does everything we need. We don't need to tailor it. Um, and I don't even think they really reviewed the detail of the training mm. before it went out. And what they found was... Um, the messaging that was in the standard off the shelf training about the c use of color, for instance, was dead against their own company internal policies, internal branding guidelines. And so you've got these new managers only literally been with the company, I think less than a week at this stage, new graduates starting, they're getting a training course, official training course that says this. And then immediately the, the organizations having to go, well, you know, that bit that you heard there, forget that because that's it. And it doesn't take a lot. That's the whole course could have remained the same apart from that one little bit if they just had that short review of what's going on and made sure that it fits in with the company culture, the company ethos, the branding, whatever that might be. I think there's a real lesson there that although it the temptation to just go off the shelf and, and often seen as cheaper, you know, it's not where you can lose value in a big way if you don't take the effort to at least test those things. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we always go through the entire program with our stakeholders yeah. to make sure that it fits. Brilliant. And what are some and of we'll, the, give us a, a few examples of uh, one or two of those courses or the themes that you cover off in those 20 plus different courses there. Yeah. So I'm putting the finishing touches on the course lead like a pro, which right. is going to match the book exactly. So it'll, it'll have nine modules, which are in, in lockstep with the book. Right. So that's everything from building empathy all the way through to coaching and feedback to managing change. Brilliant. Uh, so that'll be a companion course to the book. And then uh, I've got courses on time management, on uh, presentation skills, on facilitation, um, goal setting, coaching and feedback. So kind of the, 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 all the blocking and tackling you need as a manager to, to, to do a good job and hit the ground running. Yeah. And as you say, so often managers are just either given no training or given on the job training for somebody who's had on the job training, who's had on the job training, then mm -hmm. and the bad habits are already in there. So I think having getting in early, getting managers some standardized training, particularly in a, a larger organization, 
then you've got some common language that they're talking and you've got everybody starting off on the right foot so i love what you're doing there and it segues us nicely into into the book because i I really want to talk about this um lead like a pro i mean fantastic title to start with because who doesn't want to lead like a pro so um tell us about the book how's it structured who's it for and uh, and what can they get from it yeah so this is this is what it looks like if you head off to amazon so it'll Brilliant. it'll launch tomorrow tomorrow is launch day uh, september 20th yeah. and it's 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 not a huge it's not a huge book it's only 160 pages or so so it's it's not a massive thing mm. it's very written very conversationally you know it's me talking to you it's basically you know just me having a chat with you and saying hey this is what i've learned about management uh, either through my experience or through a lot of research. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of content in the bibliography that folks can can follow up on. And it starts at the beginning with the importance of empathy and management. I build the business case for being empathetic and why this is important. I mean, and there's real dollars and cents mm-hmm. that are that are tied to leaders who are empathetic and good listeners and genu- gen- generally good humans as opposed to those who are not. Uh, just think about what it takes to replace a high performer who's left because of their manager. Yeah. You know, depending on the the studies you read, it's, it's at least 1.2 X their salary and benefits uh, to replace somebody. And and some figures put that even higher. So better that you learn and master the soft skills as a manager so that people say, you know what? I want to work for Paul. Hmm. I like Paul and I want to, I want to keep, I'm going to stay here. Right. And that's going to save the company money. So we start with empathy and then we march through to uh, making the transition. We talk about goal setting and how to set good, smart goals, how to delegate, how to coach and provide feedback all the way through to how to manage change. Right. And uh, I, I introduced a few models. I try not to overdo it with the models, but there are a few good models there. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a management book if it didn't have a two by two matrix in it. So I got a couple of those in there. Uh, yeah. And then the the one thing that's kind of fun is at the, the, the last chapter is only a page long and it's all about putting together your own development plan. And so I really encourage readers, you know what, you've, you've read the book, you've taken notes, you've dog-eared pages, you've done something to, to call out something that mattered to you. Write it down, make yourself a smart goal, and then go find somebody you can work with on that within the week. Yeah. So within seven calendar days, talk with a colleague, talk with somebody inside, outside of work, but just say, hey, you know, I read this book and this is what I took away from it. And can we kick ideas around? Brilliant. Otherwise, you'll just forget it, you know, and it's just another business book that you spend 14 bucks on and put on the shelf and it's just gathering dust. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I, I love love this and it happens uh, with some of the great uh, facilitators and trainers that I see it's don't try to do too much but do something straight away whatever that straight mm-hmm. away timeline is you know within a week uh, within 72 hours whatever it is that uh, the timeline that you're working with but do something get that ball rolling it doesn't have to be the biggest thing it can just be the thing that gathers momentum and then you you've actually starting to get real value off the back of that so um, and I've had a chance to have a look at, at some of the book. I haven't uh, read it all yet, but I certainly will be. And uh, you know, I think this is a a, a great one that people are going to love. Um, I love the fact that you've kept it relatively short but value packed. I think there's so much to be had where the, you get some great books, but they're so massive and cover so many different things in so much detail that I, I haven't got the attention span to go into the, some of those, to be honest. Uh, and they're great for the people who want it. But actually, I'm a big fan of starting with the big picture, starting with the um, uh, with the key things that matter, and then, if necessary, you can follow it up with some uh, some follow up books and some other chapters, and people can get even more value. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I research the heck out of the book, right? And so the bibliography is pages long. And, and I make a point um, at the at the back of the book when I'm wrapping it up to tell people, you know, if you want to learn more. Everything I talked about is cited in the bibliography, so you can go dig deep if you want to. Right. If this was enough, fine. Yeah. You know, if 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 you know if you don't feel like a scholar this week, fine. You don't <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. Um, but it's there for you. Wonderful. No, no I, um, hopefully um, this should be released only a few days after launch. So uh, this episode. So if you get the chance, go out and uh, and check out Eric's book because uh, I think this one's going to be an absolute corker out there. So uh, really looking forward to hearing how well it goes for you. And I'm sure it will be. So um, let, 
I just want to switch it around a little bit in terms of um, you've got so much great stuff on how you are helping other people and you've taken the lessons from your life, you've taken the research that you've got, you're creating these resources and this great book to help others perform at their best. How does Eric perform at his best? What do you do to keep your shores sore sharpened and to be at your very best? Yeah, you know, I think it comes down to what you just said. You know, don't do too much. Right. So, said the overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I said that, and then I remembered I'm actually CEO of three companies, and I'm raising 14-year-old daughters, and for fun, I teach scuba. Yeah. But, yeah, don't do too much. <laughs> but but honestly, like I I try to keep regular hours, so I I don't stay up much past 930 at night. Right. You know, I'll get up early. But I don't stay up late. So I try to keep regular hours so that day to day, I'm not exhausted dragging right. myself through the day. Um, I try to take breaks throughout the day. I actually schedule lunch and schedule dinner so nobody can schedule meetings during, during those hours. Like right. I need to eat in the middle of the day and I need to spend time with my family over dinner. And so we have dinner at the same time together. Yeah. I try to, to spend time on weekends and holidays away from my computer. Because I'm self-employed, I'm not terribly successful at that, but... Let's say let's say we go on a three day extended weekend. We're just going a long weekend. Even if I bring my laptop with me, I might only use it an hour or two a day, hmm. and then it's folded back in my backpack, and I'm out hanging out in the spa and doing something like that. Um, we're going on a vacation to Puerto Vallarta in January, and I'm I'm debating with my wife whether we even bring our laptops. Wow. So I mean that that might that might send me into into and the withdrawals, but, <laughs> but you, you, you have to take a break, you know, because especially being self-employed, it's like my success is mine to lose. And if I, if I don't keep the gears turning, then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if I wear myself down to nothing, yeah, then nothing's going to happen anyway. I'm going to be useless and no good to anybody. I'm not going to be good to myself, my family, my customers, nothing. Right. So taking, taking breaks is probably the one thing I do. And then for me personally, being outside, uh, being in nature is really important. So whether I'm in, on, under, around water, that's that's really important. Being in mountains, I love that. I love the beach. Yeah. Uh, so that I can come back refreshed and and be at my desk and and hit it hard. Yeah. And I, I know we've talked previously as well about um, your love of diving, and you talked about uh, teaching diving as well. I'm guessing that's an absolute great one for not being able to open your laptop. <laughs> You've got no option. Whereas if you're going on a hike, you can be looking at your phone and checking your emails. But uh, it's not so easy when you're uh, under the sea there, is it? Yeah. So if if I'm not teaching scuba, if I'm actually out just for fun, yeah, it's just it's so incredibly relaxing to just be floating in the water and looking at the life that's around. It's so nice, you know, even in the Puget Sound, which is a little chilly, but I dive in a dry suit and I wear a lot of a lot of layers underneath. So I'm pretty warm. Right. And just kind of floating around going, Wow, hey, look, a crab. Yeah. You know, there's an octopus. Far out. That's great. It's it's very nice. It's it's a short break. I mean, my dives are usually an hour or less. They're not right. they're not too terribly long, but it's a really nice break from reality. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And I think there's some great lessons there for for people just to find those things that bring you back to feeling refreshed and feeling that like you are in reality, having taken a break from it, you know, whatever that might be for you. So that's wonderful stuff. Um, yeah. So maybe let's, let's ask a couple of questions here. And we, we might have touched on one or two of them already. But um, if you could help any individual team or organization with the skill set you've got, who would you want that to be? I think it would be like those new college grads that like the, the high potentials that are coming out of business school and, and are like on the fast track to becoming managers right away. Right. Like I'd want to, I have a real passion for helping people who are new at something. Right. Um, new managers, new scuba divers, new swimmers, whatever. So if I could get somebody who is like fresh out of school and ready to become a manager and get them at the beginning mm -hmm. of their career, at the beginning of their story arc so that they start with good habits, that would be, that would be a dream. Yeah. 
No, oh, that's wonderful because I, I was uh, reflecting back on my first ever management role and I thought I knew it all because I'd just come out of the, the university with all the, the methodologies and the ways of working and the line studies and everything that I was there to do and I had no idea how to manage people and I uh, I learned the hard way very early and I think mm-hmm. that's a great spot to be in, um, a w- wonderful uh, place to try to get to in terms of helping people before they even get the chance to, uh, to make any of those mistakes. So that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you could flip that round and say, if there's somebody that you could spend time with, either you know go out for a drink, have a meal, maybe go scuba diving with, uh, someone that you think you could learn from and help you perform, who would you want that to be? Uh, anybody? <laughs> anybody at all? Yeah, anybody at all. Yeah, Jesus. Right. Yeah, I would love that. I would love. I would love to go go take a walk with Jesus and just say, okay, so really, honestly, how do I do this? <laughs> not for 40 days in the desert though eh? <laughs> maybe maybe 40 days 40 days in the mountains 40 days on a beach <laughs> wonderful i'm sure yeah there's some, be some amazing stories and uh and, and you're not the only person in the pod to say that as well you know in terms of being able to just step back and go what are those key lessons that you can take what are the things we could be doing so uh that's wonderful yeah i mean you can you can read the bible and you can listen to a pastor explain it to you but to actually get it from the man that would yeah. be pretty cool Good. <laughs> awesome. Um, and finally, before we uh, we close this off, if people want to find out more, if people want to connect with you, more importantly, they want to go and check out the book. Um, how do people do that? Uh, where do people go? Yeah. Easiest way to find me is on LinkedIn. Right. Um, I'm all over LinkedIn. I post every day on LinkedIn. Yeah. So LinkedIn's the easiest thing. Uh, you're welcome to hit my website, GerardTrainingSolutions.com. Yep. And then my publishing company um, has a website with information on the book, which is gtspress.com. Cool. Awesome. And we'll make sure that all of those links are available for everyone in the show notes. Uh, so do go and check those out. Uh, you know, go out and, and connect uh, with, with Eric. I did that a couple of weeks ago, and I've uh, I've enjoyed it ever since. I follow all your stuff on LinkedIn. There's some amazing insights and stories that you share there as well. So keep it up, please, because it's uh, it's helping me perform, um, and I'm sure it'll be helping a lot of the audience as well. So. I really wish you the best of luck, um, hopefully, and I'm sure it will. Tomorrow will go an absolute storm in terms of the first day with the book. Um, by the time this goes out, who knows? You know, you could be a, a New York Times bestseller or whatever it might be. You'll be out there. But, oh, <laughs> but no, I highly it's... doubt that, but thank you. <laughs> but um, I do encourage everybody, as always, connect with our guests, reach out, Check out their, their materials, check out their courses and what they do because that's how you find out how you can perform and the sort of things that are out there that are going to really accelerate your own performance. So some amazing stories, um, some great stuff and really looking forward to seeing the book in action. Really thanks massively for being on the show today, Eric. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed this. Anytime I can return the favor, let me know. Superb. Speak soon. Cheers. All right, take it easy. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you liked what you heard, then please give the podcast a rate, review, and share. I'm Paul Teasdale, and from sausage making to banking, oil and gas to Formula One, I help people perform. If you'd like to find out more and have a conversation, contact me via helpingpeopleperform.com.